can we maybe talk a little bit about um, maybe the origin of the film? I think it's a film that you wrote uh, many years ago, but didn't shoot right away. You make a lot of different film, documentary and, 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 and fiction film, and, and you're a very versatile and prolific filmmaker. But that's a different project for you. You mentioned it's your first official comedy. <laughs> Well, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's the dialogue is, is really um, amusing. Yeah, there's an idea going on that we can talk about it, that this is a pandemic film because of the title and the, the way it seems to be made. So it's kind of true that it was made during the pandemic, but it was all, all, all written in 2015. The title comes from 2015. Mm -hmm. So I know it looks like... <laughs> But yeah, I, I was doing a, I was in a small documentary film festival in Sarajevo in Bosnia in the fall of 2015. And I decided to stay there for a full month and write something. And I didn't know if I was writing a movie, a novel, whatever. I didn't know it, what it would become. And I was heavily intoxicated by this Swiss author called Robert Walzer or Robert. Walzer or and his style is not exactly what you saw in the film but it, it he, he was a satirist if you could say he, he liked to observe everyday life in such a way that I had been reading like six or seven books in a row from this author and I was completely intoxicated so I was kind of talking like his books but really, if you read it, it's not like the film, but it's somewhere. I wrote all this. It was an echo to everything I was reading. And watching the film today, I still don't know in what state of mind I was when I wrote all this. It's very bizarre because you, you're in Sarajevo. You have no friends. It's another part of the world. You don't have any connection with anything around you. So you feel alienated by something. So... That was my total escapism. I was reading about the war all morning and then writing in the afternoon. So everything felt so bizarre. And that film, I came back to Montreal. I had 45 pages of these monologues, dialogues, and I left it in a drawer. And I never read that stuff again for five years. So during the pandemic, the actress playing the sister, she called and begged me and said, do you have something in your drawer, some, something we could play because actors couldn't do anything during the pandemic. And I was like, yeah, maybe I could call some theater actors, like very good ones. And everything was imagined like you saw people talking to each other with a lot of distance, screaming intimate things to each other. So it was totally pandemic approved, but <laughs> Again, is it a pandemic film? Well, if there was no pandemic, I would not make the film. So you see the, um, the paradox. So we just did it and we didn't have to follow any special rules because the film was made completely outside the system. It was made for a, uh, at first zero money. All the actors came for free. It was made in four days. And then we got a $25,000 grant so I could give money to people. So it was made very quick. Everybody bought their own lunch. Uh, we, we found some costumes here and there. It's shot near the New York state border in Quebec. So we had all these no man's land and we just, basically we had fun. And this film belongs to these actors because as you can see, they play 13, 14 minutes long shots of these crazy dialogues. and. I could not do much because we could not rehearse. We could not meet. So even Zoom at that time was not very, it was like April 2020. So we didn't use Zoom that much or we never met. Once we met and they said, what kind of tone do you want us to use? And since we speak uh, French in Quebec that has a special accent, we don't speak like French from France and those dialogues are very a bit like theater and literature. So they wanted to know what kind of French should we speak? So I said, don't make it like France, but don't make it like Quebec. Find something in between that can sound very sophisticated. And then we threw those Facebook and swearing words here and there for those of you who speak French. 
and we just had fun. It's very hard to intellectualize such a film. Maybe you have crazy questions for me, but we just had fun doing that. And I, I didn't have a lot of time to live with that film because it was written so much, so long ago that I didn't have time to intellectualize or live with the film. We just did it. And then we released it in Berlin, so on the internet, basically. And then I sent it to festivals where I couldn't go. So this is basically the very first time I speak in English about this film, and it was finished like eight months ago. So it, for me, usually we make films and we live with our scripts and our films for one, two, three, four years. And you know how to talk about your work, and it's all processed. But this was made so quick and for fun that it's hard for me to... I feel a little, I watched the film, something I never do, as if it's not my film. And I was laughing at those weird catchphrases as if I didn't write them. So it's a, it's a weird thing, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, long answer, I talk a lot, so <laughs> just those Quebecers, you know. But, uh, so you said there was no rehearsal and s um, on very little? So well, the main actor, He's, he no. is amazing, okay? And he said, can you give me three months, three full months? Because he had, uh, I think it was 54 pages. And I told him we're going to shoot in four days. So I think he has eight scenes or something like that. One day he made three of those scenes. And so I gave him three months, and he didn't look too nervous. And uh, the, s the sister in the film, it's his girlfriend in real life. So I took both of them. It was easier. And she said, no, he's not that nervous. I think he's going to be OK. But they were all kind of terrified because they didn't know if I was happy with the performance. But what can you do? It's a fixed shot, and it's 13 minutes. And I was just like, Ugh. they were so, I think they're, they're amazing, and they're fun. And But I was afraid that you would play too. The film, the, 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 the danger for this film is it, it can't become a farce. You see, there's a thin line between a comedy and a farce. A farce is not that fun. And I think we're just on the line. You never know what you're watching. And it's not a, you know, it's not like this. So he, he did it very good. And he said, I need to play a little physical if I may. Do you give me permission? I say, yeah, go. And they were all amazing because they are theater actors like screen actors, I think it would be a little different, but, uh, yeah. So can you talk a little bit about the relationship for you between cinema and, and, and theater? Because it's a film that, as you mentioned, it, it could be uh, yeah. like um, a stage. I'm a play. film person. Mm -hmm. I'm really, really, really a film person. Actually, I'm a theater snob. I don't go to theater. I, I don't have... A huge literary culture as well. I'm really a film person, obsessed with form, obsessed to, with narrative, how to tell a story on a 90-minute frame. I don't watch TV series. I'm always obsessed by the 90-minute film language. But when I had this material, I was totally terrified because I knew it sounded like film theater. I know it was a bit literary literature. So I thought, what kind of ideas can I find to make this film more cinematic so people don't feel they're watching film theater? So I don't know how you feel about what you just saw, but for me, my ideas were the sound, obviously, creating all this soundscape for every story. I felt that the brother and sister, they're fighting, so we found these crows. Then you have the wind with the wife and the... Um, the husband, we, we chose the wind. Then you have these exotic birds when he's in love with Cassiope. So those are, let's say, film ideas. Uh, then the locations, I could not imagine any interiors. Can you imagine the same material but in a kitchen, in a living room, or in a bedroom? doesn't make sense. It would be a sitcom. So I thought, what could be cinematic? OK, let's find some no man's lands, these large fields and stuff. So I was trying to get away from literature and theater. I'm not too sure we succeeded, but I don't think we could do this film on stage. I don't think it would be 
fun to watch this on a real stage. I don't know if you agree, but uh, I'm not sure I would watch that on a stage. Sitting in a room with actors on stage, I don't think I would enjoy it. So I think it's a film. <laughs> I think it's a film, and I, I, I do agree with you in... in um the way you bring creativity in, like the sound is, is is quite interesting, you know, like all the industrial sounds also as well that come at certain <laughs> moments. Yeah, we went a little far uh, with the rose, the, minis the, 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 the woman working from the Ministry of Tax. Yeah. We yeah. thought, okay, what, what could we bring? Okay, let's bring some noises from everyday life, like construction sites and chainsaws and stuff. And I think it makes sense in a nonsensical way, but we just did it, you know. And and, and can you talk a little bit more about the, the camera work and the cinematography, the, the framing um, also? What can you say when you have <laughs> shots like this? Well, the, the goal is not to make postcards, but you want your characters to be... I wanted them to look like figurines, and at the end, I'm giving them to you, but for the whole film, you have to struggle to imagine them in a more intimate way. So we imagined them like figurines lost in landscapes here and there. And then because I was afraid of making postcards, we decided to blur some parts in the image that's made with KY jelly on the camera. Because I made a film before that called Wilcox and uh, all the image was... Um, completely, p we put um, plastic things in front of the camera that we bought at the dollar store to distort the image and we really like what we did in that film called Wilcox. And I came back with this same director of photography and I said, what could we do? Like, same thing, but not the same thing. He said, you know, KY gel works perfectly when you do it well on the lens a bit of post-production after that. So you have this sense of distortion, a dreamy sense of uh, what you just saw is real and not real. It's 19th century, it's 20th century, it's 17th century. The costumes don't make sense. So it's really, really, everything is blurred. And my idea was just to play with this, what I would call social hygiene, meaning the right distance we need to find to talk to people. What kind of elegance today we need to talk to each other? Is elegance gone completely? Um, I must admit I was very, very influenced by social medias, like social medias in 2015 and today were quite the same. So I was feeling, I, I wanted to write something with zero swearing, very sophisticated French and people is that a word? Bickering? Is that a word? Bickering? bickering. Like you, you yes. fight Be with each other? Yeah, and, but in a very elegant way like this. So it's about finding the right distance to talk to people. And then if you want, you have this only man. So it could be a film about, I don't know, masculinity or toxic masculinity. Or I see him as this dandy guy who seems to be out of a Serge Gainsbourg song, you know, and he thinks he can charm everybody with his catchphrases and wit. And you have five women just waiting there for him to grow up. So I really like that idea that women are not moving too much in the film and they just stand there and they're waiting for men to grow up. So I, I really like that idea. And but. <laughs> So sometimes people are like, is he your alter ego? I'm like, oh, <laughs> you know, some, some guys like Antone or I don't know, w white guys like me or whatever, we like to think that we can get away with a lot of stuff by using a cute catchphrase. But I don't know, we get some people catch us. Uh, so yeah, you have all these ideas going on, but it's not too deep. It's not, we're still just having fun with these concepts. It's not nothing too profound or serious, but yeah. I, I find the dialogue are really, I, I like the translation a lot, but I think the, it's sometimes very difficult to translate from the, the uh, French I that was used. It was based on- Do you the think it's a lot, there's a lot of differences? A, a little bit. A bit, it's, it's sometimes. It's a tiny bit funnier in French, maybe. 
Well, the guy who did the English translation is Matthew Rankin. Maybe you saw his film called The 20th Century. The guy is a genius. He's incredible. Mm -hmm. And he's perfect in French, English. And I think he did an amazing job, but with such sophisticated French, sometimes you lose stuff in translation. So if some of you speak French, you probably saw the bit of a... And in Quebec French, you see, you didn't laugh at some stuff, but in Quebec, y there are some parts that are hilarious, but only for Quebecois people. So <laughs> it's like when we watch a film from Iran, you know, we, we think it's very touchy, touching, and then you ask uh, someone from Iran, and he's going to tell you, no, the actor is just bad, you know. <laughs> but for us, we were crying because we're, we're with subtitles. So it, it's always going to be the same. So. <laughs> Very good description of Iranian cinema. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you remember at the beginning of the 2000s, we were so in love with Iranian cinema, yes. but they were all, 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 all non-professional. I'm pretty sure some of these films were horrible, horribly played, but we were under the charm of everything, you know, <laughs> the subtitles, the magic of subtitles. I think there was a someone raising their hand with a question there. Yes. Because uh, that's why I watched the film, to be honest, to, to hear where people were laughing or not. And it was fun. I three or four jokes in French, nothing. So you see, we can't do anything with subtitles. And then uh, the other thing is the kind of humor. You see, three or four people left. A lot of people, it's really not for them. They don't see what's interesting in that sort of humor. Or maybe some people who just stayed for a Q&A and are like, that was not funny. What, what is so funny about it? So it's a very special type of slow humor. And if it's not for you, it's not for you. But yeah, maybe there's some French parts that we can't do anything. Well, I, I think the contrast between I mean, the dialogues and the way they're acting or standing also works for like the, the whole tone of the film and the lightness of the film. And it's not, I mean, it's a little bit unusual, uh, but it seemed, for me, it was working. I mean, I admit, I find it very but interesting. But somebody coming to me and saying, I didn't get that. <laughs> I'm like, fine, it's okay. It's, uh, it's um, particular. How, how did you work, just the name of each act, like their names? Where do they you know, come from? I love casting. I love finding names for my characters. I love... I, I don't know why we make films and we call people Bob and Joe, you know, just <laughs> be creative. But those names are real. I don't know, Eglantine, Cassiope, yeah. it seems to come out of 19th century. Mm -hmm. Antone can be pretty today as well, but how? It's just, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm telling you, this film is six years old somewhere inside me. I know I wrote it, but I feel very, very bizarre watching it. It's from another period or another person, another mind. <laughs> so, I mean, did you have different expectations and are you pretty surprised by the end result? Uh, are you not sure? Maybe? It, it's because I, I made I made 14 feature films and all of them are extremely different. I know there's something schizophrenic going on with myself, and a lot of people say, we never know what to expect from you. It's all, it always seems like a new filmmaker, every film. I don't have a problem with that. But some films are made with $2 million, and then I call a bunch of friends, and we make this for 25000 So the scale of ambition is always, always moving. So when I release a film like this, it's we are this close of making something just for fun, just for us and for fun. So of course I have my connections in film festivals. I know people. I can send my films because I have a little name. But the films they they feel so small because we made them in four days and we edited them in four days. That's the the case with this film. You think you have a small film, which is a very bad word. There are no small or big films. But when you ask about expectation, what kind of expectation for a film, f bunch of friends during a pandemic for $25,000, you don't. 
So yeah, I sent it to, I don't know, Berlinale for the world premiere, and we were in a smaller section than the main competition. I thought, okay, this is normal, it's okay, it's a smaller film. And then we won this amazing award, the Best Direction, which is which <laughs> can seem funny for a lot of people, but it made me think about what Best Direction can be. For a lot of people, Best Direction is the craft, you know, the, the, the more the cutting and the, the excitement of the direction. And for other people, it's just like the quality of the vision of something. So this film has 30 shots. It's not incredible directing if you're into craft, but if you're into vision, you can see maybe the originality or... So let's just say I had... I always have expectations for my film because I never make a film for fun. But when you win a great award and you are... New York Film Festival is not small, as you know. So a film you made with a bunch of friends during the pandemic, and I'm sitting here right now, and it's my first trip after 18 months. I'm going to get emotional, but, you know, the, that's the kind of expectation you don't expect. <laughs> But yeah, so uh, for me, it's very nice to make these small films, and then I find the strength to make the bigger ones. So right after this one, I got funding for a bigger one. I'm already working on the bigger one. And the big ones mean the industry, the rules, the everything. It's heavy, it's 30 people, it's the trucks, it's distributors, producers. Those are not my favorite films because they are more so when I come back to these films nobody to please no rules you do what you want so that's why I alternate between big and small even if I should not use so these you words have, you have two other projects like one that was already shot and you're working on yep. it now I'm uh, editing a new film we mm -hmm. shot uh, mm -hmm. during the month of uh, August Actually, my editor is working right now, and I told her, can I go to New York for four days? So she's stuck with my three-hour-long film for now. So when I come back, she's going to show me some surprises, and it has nothing to do with what you just saw. And, uh, keep myself creative, pandemic or not, we, we and shoot. And then uh, you wrote something else also? No, 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 yeah. easy there, Florence, <laughs> easy there. <laughs> No, I, I was you? I was lucky enough to make, yeah, 14 films in 16 years. So I know it's a lot, and people ask, why are you so... I'm always obsessed with that question of being prolific. I don't know what, why I'm that fast, or if I'm fighting against something, or why don't I stop for five years and do something much more ambitious than what you just saw. I don't have an answer to that. I just... But I know it's a lot of films in not that many years, but yeah. It's like the Fassbinder style of creating, I don't know. <laughs> uh, is there any question in the audience? Uh, yes. Still okay. questions. Yes, I, I feel we said everything and too much, but it's no, okay. No, he, he can talk more, I swear. <laughs> There's some, someone here. Hi, um, this is kind of a technical question. I don't know a ton about film production, but my understanding is that it's about the sound, that like capturing audio in this kind of a wide shot is, is like a kind of a challenge. So I'm just curious, how did you like capture the dialogue when you were filming it with, with this big wide shot style? Well, there's no big mystery to that. They, they have their own microphone on them and we rely basically only on that. We have a, we have a boom as well, so we, we are, mostly covered and everything is very clear but they have a mic here you know so that's how we use it and then it's called sound design so when we do post-production we add all the the, the 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 caramel you heard like the, the crows and everything that's recreated but basically what you heard is the the mic they they wear and Robert, Robert, Valzer, W A L S E R. He writes in French? It's in uh, 
I think he was from Zurich, so it's originally in German, but uh, his most... I, I, I think the first time I read a book, the first one I read was Life of a Poet, Vie de Poet. Actually, Jean-Pierre Rem gave me books by Jean Robert Valzar as a gift for my birthday once, like five years ago. Maybe some of you know him, but whatever. But y you, you didn't read it in German? No, 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 it was oh. in French. Oh, it was yeah. in French. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the the question of inspirations and influence. I, I don't want to sound rude, but you you ask those questions a lot to first time filmmakers sometimes. It still sound rude, but at 47 years old, at some point, you don't think about... After 14 films, y you don't cherry-pick from other people. It's easier when you have a blank page and you just write, you know? But everything you just said, you're right. This is Roy Anderson's style, but it, it, it's not me saying, hey, I'm 47 years old, let's make a film like Roy Anderson. So it doesn't apply, really. I just know it's the same kind of... I laughed when she said Straub and Huillet because another <laughs> critic says it's kind of Straub and Huillet. Yes, uh, yes, Beckett. So I will agree to all this, and I used to be a film critic myself, and my job and the job of film critics is to create intentions for the, the artist sometimes. Or, oh, he's probably influenced by, which it's true and it's not true. So yeah, there's no clear, clear, clear inspiration. Like uh, it's been at least four or five films that I can't tell in an interview. I don't know what to answer when people ask, "What's your inspiration?" Of course, you're gonna see stuff like, but it's very, very hard to. Like I said it like very clearly, Robert Valzai. When I was reading, I felt intoxicated by the writing, but then the film style or the I know there's a part in the film, I like to tell that anecdote. I don't know if you notice when um, when he's with the, there are three and he's fighting at the end with the guy. Did you see what happened in the back? <laughs> you saw that because it's a big screen. That was amazing. It was a mistake. <laughs> Actually, we were on the land of a lady and she said, yeah, you can come on my land and shoot your scene. So we shot three scenes on her land. And at some point, she decided to walk somewhere with two visitors to make them visit. <laughs> but she appeared at the last three seconds of the shot before I said cut. Three seconds. So my director of photography said, oh, she bombed the shot for the last three seconds. I'm like, three seconds? Yeah, 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 you can look at the rushes and she will appear in the back. So if you like that shot, she's ruining it for three seconds. So that's the shot I liked. And yes, she appears for the last three seconds. So I called a post-production manager and I said, can you erase them? And it's very easy. You erase them and you put some nature over them. And so they did it. So it comes back and they're not in the back. So I'm like, hey, wait a minute. Can they come, but for a minute and a half, instead of three seconds, they're like, yeah, give us a few days and we're going to loop them in the back. The three seconds will be looped. So they l they're looping them and, and they're like this in the back. <laughs> the three of them for a minute and a half. I say, I like that, but not the loop. Can you manage something taking care of that loop? And they did it. So it seems we have a little crowd in the back, very Roy Anderson, very, very, very Roy Anderson. So that mistake became one of the funniest visual thing in the film. So that's an advice. When you shoot and you make a mistake, don't get angry at your mistake. Take advantage of that mistake and turn it into something else. So, yeah. We, I think we changed some stuff as well in the mountain in the back. It was a ski mountain, so we had to erase the ski uh, slopes. But, uh, yeah. Do you have any 
Well, well, technically, you gave a lot of work to your technician. <laughs> it can be surprising, a very small $10,000 film. Sometimes you have yeah, to... You're you ready for Marvel. <laughs> you see, in my new film now, we have a budget for VFX. So I, I already yeah. know we have the budget for VFX, but on a film like this, easy on the VFX <laughs> because it's... Uh, yeah. It's okay, you did like three seconds, a minute. That's, that's good. We can do a final question. Uh, yes. That's an amazing question, and I think the answer is in it, because I, I cannot come here, come up here, and say it's a film about alienation. It's impossible. I, I was just caught by this state of alienation. If I can come back to this Sarajevo thing, for real, it was a very small festival. There were no guests. It was November. I was in an Airbnb with no elect. I would lose electricity at times and uh, hot water. Um, I found the only caf non-smoking cafe in the city. I had my laptop. I had zero idea. I was just intoxicated by Valzer. So you found the right word, alienated. And it can still be super creative. But I'm telling you, take you fly back home to Montreal. And when I was home, I, w I could not recognize myself on paper. So I know I'm doing this Q&A now, kind of laughing at my own film and take it very lightly. But for real, I'm not too sure I see myself in this film. It's like, a, a l some people say, did you really write that? And I start laughing because I'm, I'm not sure I could write something like that today. So those levels of alienation you're talking about, for sure, you know, and then the pandemic, uh, I still remember I told the actress, yeah, you can read it, but I didn't read it in five years because I was not ashamed of it, but I was sure that I was not in those pages. And she said, this is so amazing, Nani, we have to do this. It's so fun to read. Don't touch anything. Are you sure about that? And then I reread the whole thing and I was laughing as if I didn't write it. And um, the ending was missing. There was no ending. I wrote that ending with the flower and um, Miroslav Petorsky. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wrote that very quick uh, two months before we shot. So you see, it's kind of, it's really something you find under a rock and you're like, okay, let's say it's myself. You know, it's, uh, yeah, I, I put that under a rock 20 years ago and let's do something with it. So your question is much more fascinating than my answer, but it's still, it's very interesting to think about this concept of alienation, but I don't think it's the core of the film, but. Well, well now you can present your film uh, next time, next presentation. Oh, you just gave by me, uh, if I go on. So and, many uh, ideas. <laughs> if I go to other festivals this fall in Europe and stuff, my my cassette now, my tape, you, you helped me create my, my <laughs> tape for Q&A, my template. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have to wrap it up, but thank you so much uh, for being thank here. Thank you, everybody. About this. <laughs> there were a lot of films to see tonight, but you came to see the small Quebec film, so thank you so yes, much for the, the support. <laughs>